We have a housing shortage. In the UK, we are not building enough new homes to meet the needs of a growing population. The population is growing because we're living longer and we're living in smaller households. Last year, we built around 150,000 new homes, but we need to build around 300,000 every year to meet the needs of the growing number of households, to replace the houses that are no longer suitable to live in, and to meet the backlog of unmet need. Well, we have a shortage of housing, but the problem of how to build the houses is but one aspect of the national housing problem. There are three others. We have a problem of allocation, how to use the housing stock so that it best meets people's needs. And then thirdly, there's quality. If everyone lived in a decent house in a pleasant neighbourhood, there'd be no housing problem. And then finally, there's a serious problem of affordability. Not all households can afford to buy or rent housing of an acceptable standard that meets their needs. The four dimensions are all connected and need to be addressed together. Too often in the UK, we don't have a joined up approach to this issue while in other countries the links between the issues are clearer. For example, public support for production is often linked to very strong conditions on allocation, quality and affordability. The Cambridge Centre for Housing and Planning Research has a track record of 24 years of evidence-based housing and planning research. This means that those four housing issues have been researched across many different research projects. All of the work of the centre is intended to have direct impacts on housing and planning, policy and practice. In principle, governments can try to achieve their housing objectives by two means. Firstly, they can help households with their housing costs. So, for people who are buying a house, they can give help with a mortgage. Or, for tenants, they can help them meet the rental costs. The second approach is to help providers build more housing. The problem with the first approach is that it increases demand and tends to push up housing costs. The second approach has a direct effect on supply. The balance between demand side support and supply side support has changed a lot. Demand side support is increasing, but supply side support is falling. For rental housing, the increase in demand side support and fall in supply side support also means an increase in expenditure on housing benefits. We need to consider the case for more bricks and mortar support that increases housing production. When demand for housing increases, house prices rise and the value of land is pushed up. These rising land values bring gains to those who already own housing and to those who own land. But they don't necessarily mean that more housing will get built. Looking at other countries has several benefits. For example, we can compare the volume of national resources that goes into housing investment, that is money that's used to build or improve the housing stock. By international standards, housing investment in the UK has been low for a long time. Between 1996 and 2011, in the UK, just over 3% of output was devoted to housing investment. In Germany, it was 6%, in France, 5%, in the USA, about 4.5%. By looking at other countries, we can also get new ideas to improve policies. We can learn how to make supply-side support conditional on the housing being fairly allocated, of good quality and affordable. There is no one simple approach to boosting the supply of housing affordable to households on lower incomes. There are, rather, a series of options which could be considered, including increasing the supply of building land, taxing rising land values, encouraging builders to make more of their profits from house building and less from dealing in land and tying public support for house building to allocation, affordability and quality conditions. Two other countries in particular have used tax breaks to try and increase the supply of affordable housing. These are France and the USA. In France, conditional tax incentives have helped supply extra housing to households on limited incomes. They've been responsible for many thousands of extra units of housing. In the USA, low-income housing tax credits go to providers who agree to keep rents below a particular level, allocate the housing to households on low incomes, and charge low rents. The providers, who can be public, private or non-profit organisations receive the tax credits 
and sell them to investors. Because they're tradable, the tax credits have helped a whole range of providers. Since 1986, low-income housing tax credits have helped support an additional 2.5 million units of affordable housing. Tax measures do not work on their own in other countries. They are not a silver bullet. They may need to work alongside other measures, such as cheap land or income support for very poor families, but they can make an important contribution to increasing the supply of affordable housing. Politicians and the press agree we have a housing supply problem and that too few houses are being built, but no one has the answer to this problem. What can we achieve? Well, we can build more affordable homes if there is the will to change things. We can deliver new neighbourhoods that are pleasant places to live and have a range of modern amenities. An ideological commitment to home ownership and a belief that rising house prices are a good thing can act as a barrier to promoting the supply of affordable rented housing. So can sheer inertia and a lack of political will to make changes that will take longer than the electoral cycle to have their full impact. And then there's ignorance, a lack of understanding of the alternatives and their possible benefits. Policymakers need to consider the evidence and look at new ways to boost housing investment. New tax incentives will not work alone, but the evidence suggests that combined with other measures, including additional sources of land for house building, they can have a big impact.